move to item three, uh, four point three. We have two more items before us. Uh, four point three, consideration Ma of requests by Mayor Shea and Council Member Carroll. Why? Just one second. Uh, that went so quick, we didn't read the title of the ordinance. That's the bad news, but the good news is, is that Mr. Tran did read it during the presentation. I just wanted to say that for the record. So should we have the maker of the motion redo that? Nope, nope, okay. nope, nope. it was read Thank you for keeping us on track, even a little late, but thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> with that, we'll move to item 4.3. Uh, and I'll turn this over to Council Member uh, Carroll, who actually brought this forward. Thank you, Mayor Shea. Uh, I, yes, I would like to, uh, you know, Mayor Shea and I have uh, requested to change a uh, portion of the uh, city council policy and procedure uh, with regard to agendizing items for purposes of the council meetings. And uh, this would also, just for clarification, pick up Great Park board meetings. Uh, currently, any city council member can request that an item uh, be placed on a future city council agenda by delivering a memorandum to the city manager. Uh, and there are time limits under our Sunshine Ordinance, whether the, in terms of the amount of days that are needed before uh, such an item can be put on the agenda with regard to items that would uh, either require or would uh, be requesting a report of the staff of the city. And those items which would not require uh, or a staff report is not being requested. Uh, we would propose to change the current policy uh, such that city council uh, initiated agenda items uh, will be placed on city council agendas when uh, one of the two things happen. Uh, the first thing would be two members of the city council agree to place it on the agenda or the mayor, the sitting mayor of the city of Irvine would have the authority to place an item to, on the agenda. So that single council member, in this case a sitting mayor position, uh, would have that that authority retained, him or her would have, be able to agendize something as a single person. Uh, over the past month, I've conducted a survey uh, of the surrounding cities in the County of Orange and outside the County of Orange, and I found that the agendizing policies uh, really run the gamut. But as just two examples, locally, the city of a Anaheim requires two council members to bring an item forward on the agenda and the city of Newport Beach, which has a council of seven, require three council members to do this. Uh, there's no real magic to this. Uh, for me, uh, it allows the city council to focus its efforts on the core items of city business, and I think it had, there's a secondary effect in that it encourages collaboration uh, of seeking support, if you will, or certainly support to agendize something uh, with a number, another member of the, of the body here before we put it on the agenda uh, for purposes of the city council. And I would think just the third uh, benefit that comes to mind is resources. Uh, the, the resources of the city staff required to prepare, uh, you know, taking city time and effort and energy uh, and investment of time uh, to prepare staff reports for some of these items uh, so that we would like our opinion, uh, the proposers here, a modicum of support uh, from from two members uh, or the mayor. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the purpose for we would bring this forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, I just want to add a point. I know several years ago we had a, a problem with one of our council members that found it um, in his interest to bring a, the, a certain item forward every, every council member, a um, meeting, I'm sorry. Um, every two weeks, talking against the school district, saying they didn't do the proper mitigation for their high school site. It took up so much time and so much staff time, and several years ago, I wanted to bring this forward. When you brought it up, I thought, you know, I should have done it then. I think it's a good idea to do it now. Other cities do it. It wastes a lot of staff time, especially doing, during a political campaign when certain members of this council are running for office. They tend to have um, please don't laugh. You may not like it, but don't laugh. I know, but let's just don't laugh. I, can I finish my thoughts? Yeah, okay, so let's just, let's just let me finish my thoughts, please. Um, I don't laugh when you come up, so please don't do that when I'm speaking. I appreciate it.
having good manners. Um, so consequently, we had this problem in the past, and um, it just takes a lot of staff time. And then during a campaign seasons, there tends to be a um, propensity for certain council members to be bringing forward certain issues to promote themselves in an election cycle. And it really is irritating, and it's also very time consuming for our staff to have to spend so much time, especially if someone doesn't even have support. It's just a grandstand. So I think it's a, a good policy. Like we said, other cities have been doing this or have a, approved these, um, uh, this, these ideas to make sure that one or two members uh, or two members of the council have to approve uh, an item to go on the agenda. And generally speaking, I don't think we would ever have a problem. I think when something's redundant, that's when we would have an issue and have the ability to implement this uh, procedure. So uh, with that, we have uh, any other comments from council members? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and then we have speakers. Thank you. I, I just want to point out, I think that council member Carroll brought this up in his remarks. You know, in order to have a, a, a working dialogue on these issues, in order to move the conversation forward, it's parliamentary procedure. You need a second. So if you're bringing something up, knowing that you're not going to get a second, knowing that you might not get three votes, you, you really are moving in a direction where you're just trying to make a statement. And, and I will have a conversation with Council Member Fox when she returns. I don't want this to be an out-and-out -out attack on her. Um, but she has twice now sat at this dais and turned to us, and I'm only going to speak for myself, and said, I reached out to my co council colleagues and agreed to work with him. And on at least two occasions when she said that, I sat here and went, you never reached out to me. You never talked to me. And we talk a lot. I I've been around this building a while. I haven't heard the word, you know, partisanship thrown around so often. And, and the irony is, I think we probably have the least amount of partisanship that's ever been in this building. And I don't want to put her on the spot because somehow there are people in this community that think this is a bad thing. I talk to Council Member Khan all the time. And I'm sorry that that probably makes you look really bad in the eyes of some people. But this is a council that has so far worked together and I would say right now, and if she was here, Councilmember Fox and Councilmember Khan and Councilmember Carroll and the mayor, if you have an issue that you want to bring up, call me. I'll probably put my name on it. I, but to bring something forward, to know that you won't have a second, is, is, is somewhat irresponsible. So that's, that's my contribution to the conversation. Okay, so um, yes. Uh, Councilmember Khan. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to chime in a little bit, kind of agreeing with um, Councilmember Kuo. It's very difficult, and if some of you know how policies get moved forward, you need to make sure you're doing the work behind the scenes. You need to be working with not only the community, but community organizations, and getting our colleagues educated and briefed on issues that we're hoping to bring forward. You saw today the climate action plan that um, was brought forward, and you saw the discussions that took place, and it happened because there were a lot of behind-the-scenes communications. Robin, um, with the climate action um, group, was meeting with my colleagues, was meeting with me, and we were communicating on how to move things forward. And so when I put this on the agenda, I reached out to Mayor Shea and made sure that she was aware that I had an interest in this, and today we passed it 4-0. So I know there's a lot of people that are calling this a power grab, but I have to say, sitting in the last two meetings here has been very difficult. When a colleague will place something on the agenda knowing it's gonna fail, only to promote themselves, and at the end of the day, it's the community that's run over the bus, run under the bus. It's, it's unfair to the community members to sit here in hopes that something is gonna pass, not knowing that there has been no work done behind the scenes. 
And so I am supportive of this policy change just to help us move forward, to help us work together. And I'll tell you honestly, I wasn't reached out by Council Member Fox when the pride flag issue came up. I was not reached out by her when the Veterans Cemetery issue came up. And it's important for us to keep those lines of communication open and to work together because that's how we're actually gonna do good for our communities. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, this time we're gonna to move to uh, public comments. We have quite a few speakers, um, all familiar. Uh, Susan Sayer and Jack Fancher, followed by Jacob uh, Ribikoff. Hi, my name's Susan Sayer and I'm a long time Irvine resident. Our, uh, our Mayor Shea, and with unbelievable approval by Council Member Carroll is seeking to reduce the power and authority of city council members by requiring two city council members to su submit memorandums to place items on the city council agenda while not requiring any support for, her, uh, for Mayor Shea to place an item on the agenda. I noticed Mayor Shea and Commissioner Carroll put this item on the agenda knowing that Commissioner Fox would be out of town for this meeting as I believe that a policy change that reduces the power and authority of city council members should be voted on by the entire city council, I request that you consider having this matter continued at a city council meeting when all five of city council members are present. What is the public benefit of the change? The stated reason is to have the city council focus on its energy on core items of city business. However, in thinking about the long range effect of the change, the potential for expediency is outweighed by the potential for a negative impact on the city decision making process. First, it would increase the power and authority of the mayor and thus decrease the power and authority of the individual council members. Under the city manager form of government, the mayor is a ceremonial position and thus all five of the city council members are equal with regards to their power and authority. So I ask you, what is the purpose of increasing the power and authority of the mayor? Secondly, the change would also encourage council members to form coalitions and make backroom deals out of sight and earshot of the public, thus resulting in the loss of honesty and transparency in the city's decision-making process. I am opposed to the proposed policy change, but if you must make a change, please keep the power and authority of all five council members equally distributed. This can be done by amending the proposal to read city council initiated items will not be placed on the future agenda, council agenda items unless requested in a written memorandum signed by one, at least two members of the city council or two by the mayor and at least one member of the city council. I used ask each of your city council members, please do not throw away your power and authority. Please protect our city's democratic process and refuse to agree to the proposal as written. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your um, comments. And uh, hi, nice to see you. Vigorous debate is part of our democratic process. Precluding individual council members agenda items would be undemocratic, stifling minority views, and preventing public participation. This motion would further undermine the dem democratic principles of our city government. Another detrimental technique already used by the city council with similar effect is the occasional misuse of substitute motions. I've witnessed two instances where substitute motions were used to reject an original motion without a vote on the original vote motion and replaced with a vote on a favor, in favor of a stalling or non-germane substitute. The original motion was published in the agenda in advance of the hearing. We, the public, get to speak to the original motion but has no opportunity to speak to the substitute motion. The substitute motions obviously prepared in advance were produced after the public had been allowed to comment on the original motion. This occurred a year ago, year ago when the resolution to again adopt the artist site for the State Veterans Cemetery was instead replaced with an indeterminate make work substitute motion calling for more study. Consideration of the golf course site was added after that vote. 
A year later, there still has been no city council vote on the veteran cemetery site selection. The June agenda on the, art, the veteran cemetery artist site was canceled without opportunity to speak. Also in June, the original resolution regarding the pride flag did not get a city council vote, but a valueless substitute motion was passed without the opportunity for public comment on it. After thanking the speakers who were largely positive and respectful, one of you then likened the public hearing process to a, as, to a spectacle of divisiveness. Now we have this vindictive motion. My belief is that the city council members should have the dignity and courage to vote on the original motions rather than the false flag approach of voting for something that only kills the original motion. Lastly, I s reject the proposal that would reduce citizen participation in our city government. I further suggest city council members should publish their substitute motion 24 hours before the public hearing or the public comment period should be reopened on the disclosure of a substitute motion in that same hearing, or the item should be continued with the substitute motion appearing on the next published agenda along with the original proposal. Don't reduce public participation, please. Thank you very much. So then we have Jacob Babakov. Hi, good to see you again. And then uh, Ken Stahl, file uh, followed by Brianna Lynn. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, hi again. Um, there's a lot to say about efficiency, but in some ways, efficiency isn't a good thing. Uh, energy bars are efficient, and they taste terrible, and nobody eats them. Um, I also, I know this is on TV, but I'll say it. We don't need to follow Anaheim. We're Irvine. We're much better than Anaheim. Um, and I'm particularly offended, no offense, Carol is unelected. I don't see why we should be having a uh, proposition to be so detrimental to be propped up by an unelected council member, albeit a council member, without an elected council member present, uh, being Fox. I think we should just wait till 2020, the election's on its way, and we could bring this up on 2020, okay? That's all, thanks. Thank you for your comments. Ken, followed by um, Good Brian evening again. Uh, I also oppose this um, proposal. I have two reasons. Uh, one is all of the reasons that have been stated, I don't understand why they wouldn't also apply to a motion brought by the mayor. I don't see why there should be a different policy for the mayor versus a city council member, especially in a city like Irvine where all of the council members as well as the mayor are elected on a citywide basis. So you all represent the same citywide constituents. And by the way, that's different from Newport Beach and Anaheim, which both have district elections. So it might make more sense in a city like that that a mayor could place something on the agenda and an individual council member couldn't. But every member of this council represents the same citywide constituency. And I'm not sure why there should be a different policy for the mayor versus a council member. The other reason I oppose the motion is because I think it would too, too much increase secrecy uh, in the city's uh, dealings uh, in that uh, council members would have to deal with each other behind the scenes uh, but it, rather than in public. Uh, and as you know, of course, uh, it's uh, illegal under the Brown Act for more than two council members to meet together before it has to become a public meeting. So essentially what would happen is if you're unsuccessful in getting one city council member to join your motion, now you, you're out of luck because you can't talk to anybody else unless you go through a third party intermediary, right? And then you basically are using this, uh, this uh, third party behind the scenes to shuttle back and forth between the council members and having the conversation again behind closed doors without it being out in public. So for those two reasons, I, 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 I oppose the motion. I'd ask you not to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brenna Lynn, followed by Harvey List and Kev Abajanian. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, my name is Brianna Lynn, and I've been an Irvine resident for 32 years. Um, and before I begin, I'd like to ask, maybe the city manager can address the issue that Mr. Stahl just brought up regarding if a council member went to one other council member for support and was unable to get that support, would they then be able to go to a, sec a second council member without violating the Brown Act? But I We can turn to the city attorney, uh, or during public comments, we could bring it up after, right? Well, can I... Why don't you finish your comments oh, sure. and then we'll bring it up when you're done, okay? Okay, thank you. I think that's because we can't have dialogue. Sure. But I'll make sure we bring that up. Thank you. 
Have you ever experienced a situation where one person's bad decisions impacted several others? And the first one that came to mind was, you know, one person who made the horrible decision to do something harmful, put it in their shoe at the airport, and going forward, the rest of us had to be impacted and we no longer could wear our shoes, right? Another, on a much smaller scale um, example, was in our office, uh, they have a no heating fish policy in the microwaves. But, you know, some people still want their heat, their fish heated, and so they will use the microwave, and eventually they ended up taking the microwave for the office, and we had to go downstairs to the um, public area to heat our food. Bringing it back to Irvine City Hall, I think we can also agree, it is not considerate for a council member to place items on the agenda for political posturing purposes. It is not considerate for a council member to ask the community from all over Orange County to come out in support of an agenda item when very little has been done to ensure it will succeed. It is not considerate for a council member to use their platform as an elected Irvine City Council member to campaign for another seat. We have a council member who has not been considerate, non considerate of the residents and not considerate of her fellow council members. So I ask if this is what this agenda policy change is really about, which it sounded like it was based on the discussion before public comments, then please focus it on the person who is causing the distractions but not place the rest of our city under this requirement which leads to potential Brown Act violations and makes it harder for residents to be heard in a meaningful way. I believe this temporary benefit does not outweigh the long-term risks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. City Attorney, should I ask you after public comments that question? Or can you please answer that question? I'm happy to do so. Okay, good. Uh, First of all, as, as, as everybody seems to understand, two people uh, communicating with each other does not violate the Brown Act. Interestingly, and in addition, this is what I was pulling up when uh, you asked the question, Government Code Section 54956, which relates to circumstances under which a special meeting may be agendized, says that a special meeting may be agendized either by the mayor, unilaterally, or by a majority of the members of the legislative body. And the reason it says that is because it is one thing for a majority of the members of the legislative body to get together and talk about whether they support or don't support or develop a consensus on an issue. And it's another thing under the Brown Act for a majority of the members of a legislative body to get together and talk about whether something ought to be on a future agenda without talking about the substance of the agenda item. Now, I don't want to say that that's the proposed policy before you. The pr proposed policy before you is that only two, not a majority of the members of the body do it. But it is certainly possible for one member to speak to another member and have a, about whether something should go on the agenda, not whether the item is to be supported or not supported, but whether it should go on the agenda. And if the answer to that question is no, then there are two things that can happen. One is come and talk to me so that we can make sure that we've not gone too far in terms of that first conversation and then have a conversation with someone else. The other is come to a city council meeting, and during a city council meeting, during council member comments, say, I'd like to see if I could get something agendized. Is there anybody else here that would like to see that happen? And that, that would happen during a public meeting and avoid any, any appearance of a violation of the Brown Act. So there are tools in the toolbox to deal with all of this. And just to reference the mayor, because there are specific times that the mayor needs to call a special meeting, and so to put me into a box, not me, but the mayor, whoever's here, that they would have to go to a council member to do that, that's, I think, the reason why the mayor's position is left out, because of some of these specific requirements that the mayor has uh, abilities to set agendas, et cetera, that other members do not have. Certainly, it would put us in an awkward position if we had state law saying that the mayor has the power to call a special meeting at any point in time, but we had a local policy that said that the mayor can't call us, can't agendize anything for any meeting without the vote of somebody else. Yeah, it, that it's too encumbering, so that was the only reason why the mayor was left out of that decision. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. Um, okay, this time we'll call on Joe um, McLaughlin. Oh, I'm sorry, Harvey, you're next. Sorry, come on up. And then Joe McLaughlin, filed by Robin Gurian. Mayor, council members, I'm the same Harvey Ellis who spoke an hour ago or so. <clears throat> um, in relation to uh, Anaheim, by the way, I'm reading from the Anaheim blog, and perhaps it's wrong because I didn't read the actual uh, uh, ordinance, but it says here that uh, 
<clears throat> Under the new policy, a council member will need the assent of at least two colleagues. That means three council members ha have to uh, approve of uh, um, an item to get put onto the agenda, unless this is incorrect. I think if they have seven members. They have the seven, yes, yeah, so they'd be requiring three like out Newport of the seven Beach, yeah. to do that. Also, uh, regarding what our city attorney said, if somebody wants to get the uh, assent of another council member, they could go to the first council member who says no, and then go to the second one who says no. In effect, the person would have to uh, talk to all of the remaining council members being absolutely sure that no content is, dis is discussed, only the title, I suppose, and how complicated can the title be? Uh, that sounds like extreme uh, hair splitting. <clears throat> Obviously, this is intended against council member Fox and it's unfortunate that she's not here. I think she should be here to participate in this, in this discussion. I think it's important for, for any council member who each council member has their own constituency, and that constituency, in effect, will not be represented if the council member, any council member, cannot put an item on the agenda, even if there is no second. At least it appears as a title, and it's possible that in, in the interim, a second certainly can come up. I don't think it's appropriate to start polling everyone on the council to see if a measure, uh, if an item should be put on the agenda or not, if it's truly representative of their constituency. So I really think, although I don't believe, I didn't find that the Anaheim measure was challenged, I believe this is certainly challengeable based on First Amendment rights. And I'm certainly not aware that it has been a problem here that the uh, council has been overwhelmed with these uh, uh, agenda items that go nowhere. Possible it happened in Anaheim, I'm not there, I don't know, that was the complaint there. I'm not aware that it happens, that's happening here. I think it's an extremely bad policy to start that here. It's gonna result in just a huge amount of, I mean, we have a, d a divided council as it is. It's gonna make things really, really worse for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, we're honestly not divided at all. We get along pretty well. But thank you for your comments. You have every right to them. Um, and, okay, so, yeah, Robin. Uh, I'm sorry, who was next? Oh, Kev, you were next? And Joe first. I'm sorry, it was Joe first, and then it was... Um, first and hardest, and then... <laughs> right. Hi, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, sure. So, <laughs> I gotta say, if I were a council member, uh, I'm not, uh, I would be totally opposed to this, Farah, in particular, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised because you could easily be in a position where you would want to be able to introduce something yourself, um, but can't. Uh, I think it's odd to want to tie your own hands. If you remember, the, one of the most recent occurrences where a single council member put an item on the agenda that was very divisive and controversial, and in my opinion, a huge waste of time of this council and of the public was Mayor Wagner with the proposal to have the city, the city council oppose the state sanctuary law. And that was a very obviously a political move to help the campaign of Mayor Wagner, Mr. Quo, and Ms. O'Malley, because you campaigned on, it was on your literature. We, we, you did, it was on literature, it was paid for to help you, put it that way. Uh, so, uh, the, the vote's gonna be obvious. I think you actually three, need three votes officially to move this as the emergency item, quote unquote. I don't know what the emergency could possibly be, but you do need that, you haven't moved that yet. I imagine you will. So, you've, many of you have been commissioners, I think three of you at least, uh, city commissions. I don't think any city commission requires two commissioners to place an agenda item on their agenda. I could be wrong, and is that, I think that's the case. Uh, if you're a member of Congress, as Mr. Carroll pointed out about the pride flag, you don't need to get someone else to uh, uh, introduce your bill with you. It's good to get co-sponsors, I agree, but you can do that yourself. Um, so, and then finally, so there was discussion, Mr. Carroll, by you mentioned of avoiding toxic partisanship, Mr. Carroll. Uh, as you know, this uh, move to suppress minority votes, dissenting votes, has been sponsored by the Republican Party across Orange County, in Anaheim, in Westminster, and other places. So this is injecting some actual toxic partisanship into this council, which supposedly, Mr. Carroll, particularly, you were trying to avoid. 
This is a toxic partisanship move. And you agree, apparently. <laughs> Thanks for agreeing with that. So uh, I'm sorry. We don't, I'm sorry, you shouldn't be. No, I'm happy to engage. No, it's, no we don't, we can't engage, it's you, illegal. You can, do whatever, so. you, can never, you can do whatever you want, thank you so much. This is disappointing, it's anti-democratic. I'm disappointed in, far, in you, particularly Farah, because it's, it's not, I don't think it's very smart, honestly, either. Uh, so uh, do what you will, and uh, uh, <laughs> thank you for your time, bye. Thank you for your bills. Kevin, uh, Abajini, you're welcome to come up. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, um, for your attention. So I just wanted to take a frank assessment of what's going on with this proposal, and it is a power grab. Two members of our Mayor Council who were appointed and not elected, the Mayor and Council Member Carroll, uh, are taking positions uh, to move or to change City Council policy to take away power from the other three Council members. That's not acceptable. I'm asking the other member of the members of the council who are here, council members Quo and Khan, to not let their power be taken away. By requiring any agenda item to have two members of council support it before it can be heard places a huge obstacle to hearing new initiatives from our council members. There is disagreement as to whether going to a second person, a second council member to agendize an item is a Brown Act violation or not, but I don't think we should even be going there. Each of you on the mayor council here represent over 55,000 residents. Disenfranchising uh, one of you from putting an agenda item forward is effectively a disenfranchising 55,000 Irvine residents. If this agenda limitation was in place, this council would not have heard many of the initiatives started this year. This council would not have considered flying the pride flag last month on the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. This council disgracefully declined to fly the pride flag on our city hall, even though Anaheim, Santa Ana, Fullerton, and Costa Mesa proudly flew the flag on their city halls. This council will likely not consider a discussion of designating Irvine's veteran cemetery in the heart of El Toro Marine Base at the ARDA site. And lastly, we just heard the climate action plan proposal that was put forward by a single council member, council member Khan. We don't know if that would have come up. I'm asking this council to say no to, dimin to diminishing its power, to say no to diminishing the power of its residents, and to say no to backroom deals that this change would encourage. Thank you. Robin Girian, followed by Steven Berger. Hi, I concur with my fellow residents. This is a really bad idea. And I, I, I'd like you to think about this not necessarily in terms of the short-term benefit, but think about this in terms of the long-term strategy and the long-term impact that something like this would have um, on the city and on the residents. First of all, I. I do want you to consider the kind of inconsistency uh, of you know, why you're trying to do this why, when um, there's one person on the city council that has the opportunity to put whatever they want on the agenda when no one else can. So there's a little bit of inconsistency there where you're trying to say, well, what we're really trying to do is maintain some decorum across the dais um, where you're still giving one person more power than everyone else. But, you know, what you're doing to the residents in this case is that you're limiting the residents' voice, and you're requiring the residents to have to speak and lobby to more than one council member. That is an incredible, incredibly high expectation of uh, your residents in this city. We don't, we may not have that much time and we may not have those kinds of resources, but more important than that, um, I, I, with all due respect to um, city attorney, uh, section 
4952.2 paragraph B of the Brown Act specifically states that serial meetings of a majority of council members is a violation of the Brown Act. And so regardless of these special meetings, what you're putting your residents in the position of is potentially asking city council members if they get even one denial um, with the first two council members and they go to a third, you're asking that resident to require the city council to violate the Brown Act. I, I really hope that you will reconsider this. There are so many other ways that we, as a city, we're one of the most educated cities in the country. We can tell when a city council member is grandstanding. We're not influenced by that. I really hope you won't be either. Thank you very much for your comments. Mayor. Yes, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, city attorney. I just. Uh, Melching. I want to make it clear that this is not a close question, this question about serial meetings. And so while we've been here, I've pulled up the League of California Cities brochure, open in public, on the Brown Act. It has a question in it. The question is, a member of the legislative body contacts two other members on a five-member body relative to scheduling a special meeting. Is this an illegal serial meeting? Answer, no. The Brown Act expressly allows a majority of the body to call a special meeting, though the members should avoid discussing the merits of what is to be taken up at the, at the meeting, which is precisely what we said before. But I just wanted to let you know, we weren't out on an island on this. That's the advice of the League of California Cities. Okay, thank you, I know. So sometimes we don't want to hear facts, but please go ahead. Good evening. Mayor Shea, Council Members Quo, Khan, and Carol. My name is Stephen Berger. I've spoken to the Council before, but not this particular Council. So I thank you for allowing me the chance to address you. Uh, I have been most impressed by the comments basically against this proposal uh, by virtually every speaker, every public speaker. And they make a lot more sense to me than Mayor Shea and Council Members Carroll's, Council Member Carroll's comments in support of the proposal. Uh, the bottom line is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. At present, any council member can place a city council agenda item himself or herself. There's no buddy system and there's no partner required. The agenda item then rises or falls on its own merits. The interest it espouses, and the support it generates. That's appropriate and as things should be. The political process and democracy works best with transparency, full disclosure, and honest and open discussion. The council can control at any time any agenda item by withholding a second or by defeating a motion by a majority vote. That's always the way it works. Right now, what I hear is that this is a blatant and overt attempt, patent, to stifle and isolate Council Member Fox, for whatever reason. It's not proper, it's bad, it's silly, it's petty. Right now, it's, stifle, it's uh, Council Member Fox. Tomorrow, it could be any one of the other Council Members. And I ask you to think about that very, very carefully and very seriously. In addition, we have two people on this council who are unelected, Mayor Shea and Council Member Carroll. It is not appropriate for you to impose this change of procedure when you are unelected representatives. I implore you not to choke, restrict, and obstruct the current ability of any council member to put a council member, a council agenda item. There's no need for a, um, there's no need for any kind of pre-approval by the mayor or two council members. The procedure ain't broke. Please don't fix it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just for the record, I have been elected, but not to mayor. So I am an elected official, but I was appointed mayor. That so, is correct, but you uh, are an unelected mayor. Lauren uh, Johnson, the last, uh, Judah, um, I'm sorry, Cambota, and then Lauren Johnson. Oh, Utah, I'm sorry, Cambodia. You want to speak? Okay. 
Good evening again. Well, I'll just say this is pretty strange. Um, the desire to punish a council member for grandstanding is certainly not a reason to change a rule. The, my concern is threefold. It creates a class of council members who either can get a second or can't get a second. And I remind you that nobody is in the majority forever up there. The rules that you create today will be long past you guys serving. And so um, that is concerning that it would be used to punish a council member. I also think a second reason um, that getting rid of the sole agendizing ability is a problem is, it, is because it encourages favor trading, it encourages backroom deals. And what I mean by that is that an exchange of a second is actually quid pro quo. And we all did the same training, you actually did perhaps more. But it's unethical and it's impermissible to trade seconds just like it is to trade votes. Third, the democratic principles of preserving the power of the minority matters. It matters in government. And as chair of the Community Services Commission, I encourage our commissioners to agendize items. I've encouraged Commissioner Lynn to agendize items that she cares about as, long, as well as other uh, commissioners. And that is because it may be important to the community, but I may not know about it. I might not be compelled by that issue, but that doesn't mean that it's not, um, it doesn't matter just because it's not within my knowledge or purview. In fact, that's how democracy works best, when those who are elected or otherwise bring forth the issues that the residents care about. And as trustees of the democratic institutions here in this city, I urge you to reconsider this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, and Yuta Gamboa again. So um, I totally agree with you that promoting oneself and grandstanding is very annoying, a waste of time and inconvenient. Collaboration, on the other hand, is very much desired. However, having that bound by a written rule, I don't think should be the case. I really urge you, City Council, to find a different solution to prevent that and move forward in a different direction because I uh, don't think taking away the independence of each council member or, well, not the mayor in this case, but, but, but each council member is desired. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, this time we'll turn back to the city council for any other follow-up comments to be made. There's been a lot of questions brought up and concerns. Uh, council member Khan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I understand where the public is coming from and I thank you for speaking up. But I, again, I, I've shared my concerns and sometimes it's difficult um, to make these decisions. Maybe what I can offer um, the mayor and council member Carroll is um, a friendly amendment to make this policy change uh, temporary, maybe with an expiration date, um, you know, getting through this election cycle, I don't know, January 2021, if that's um, acceptable, I think that might be a better compromise. And can you just explain a little more detail why you we would want to suggest that? Um, we've shared some of our concerns moving forward of why we are um, proposing this policy. And I think that, you know, in January 2021, we will have a new council. Um, we can adjust at that time whether this is something we want to move forward with or maybe let go of, depending on how well things are moving. Well, I, I would second that. I have no problem if we want to um, put in there a sunset clause that it would sunset at a certain point. But if the council wants to continue it because it's been an effective tool to um, uh, ensure that we get the business of the city uh, on a standard you know, trajectory, I would be fine supporting that. It wouldn't be a problem for me, so. And, uh, council Member Carroll, followed by Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Shea. I would be, yeah, I would be amenable to that if that's uh, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Khan's motion, and that's been, I heard you second it, so that's 
I'm supportive of that. I would just say just a couple of things. Uh, I wrote a lot of things down, but I'll just be brief. Um, you know, we've heard not smart, toxic, stifle minority views, undermine, uh, there's another under word I can't read, inappropriate, isolate, punish, and backroom deals. I think that if that's the case, that we'd have to apply that to 29 Palms, Menifee, Ojai, Santa Rosa, Camarillo, Sunnyvale, Upland, Poway, Villa Park, Fullerton, Anaheim, and Newport Beach. And, and I haven't done an exhaustive survey, but I have checked those, and, and you know, the, one of the speakers pulled up stuff on the internet, and you can, you can confirm that if, if you like. So to talk about the fact that we have a divided council and four of us up here unanimously voted on something that might fault along political lines. Let's not be silly and let's not be naive, everyone out there and everyone up here. Climate action plan is, I don't even, I don't even know what to say, except that it just strikes me that certain people just are not gonna be pleased in the public. But I'm gonna think about 277,000 people that may not be in this room, that might be supportive of a climate action plan, that a council listened to tonight with a lot of people advocating it, some that are in this audience, that spoke also on this issue. And I would just simply say that I'm absolutely for sunsetting it and that a council with three votes can determine the policy that it needs. And there are other, you know, decent cities out there in Orange County, I, I guess I count four here, Fullerton, Villa Park, Anaheim, Newport, there may be others. And we think that from an efficiency perspective, that's just, you know, makes a lot of sense. So, you know, with that, I, I'm, I'm supportive of this. Uh, Council oh, Mayor I'm sorry, Mayor Shea. One other thing I just want to point out, I do appreciate the public comments about, you know, effectively what's being, you know, the boomerang effect. And as the co-author of the memo, uh, I absolutely thought about the fact that this could redound to something where I may not be able, I mean, I'm, I hope everyone recognizes that I think we're all intelligent enough to realize that this could affect the member that's not here but could very likely affect the person who's speaking right now. So I think, at least personally, the way I resolve that is that if I cannot get the support of one other member of this council, well, I'll probably be banging my fist on in this dais uh, so long as I'm the appointed legally serving council member and possibly reelected next November uh, council member to try to get the public to support me to get another council member or the mayor to support an issue here. But yes, I did think about the fact, excuse me, ex Joe, you're always just so rude. Could you stop it already? You're it's not always, supposed to be It's always to fun to hear from one of our newer residents. Everybody else so, behaves. You just don't. It's just very I, irritating. It's what he wants. So I would just, I would like to just complete my sentence. Is that yes, I actually did think about the boomerang effect, and uh, you know, it did sit very heavily with me. And city attorney, we had a discussion about that boomerang effect actually before we put this memo together. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, so Mayor Pro Tem Quo. Thank you. Um, so, ironically, I'm going to be in the minority on this. I, I don't support a sunsetting clause because I think that if we put in a sunsetting clause, it does look like we're specifically trying to punish one person. Although one person is probably the root of why this was brought forward, I think it's good practice because as we went through in our opening comments, something, a, a measure has to get a second to even have a discussion. And so you gotta throw an idea out there. It's our job as, as representatives of this community to go out there and build consensus. I, I, and I say this with all due respect, I think Mayor Shea and I are the only ones on here who have served in the quote unquote political minority in these bodies. I served for two years on the planning commission in the minority. It was not a friendly experience. I got cut off. I wasn't allowed to speak. I couldn't put forward motions sometimes. And, and thankfully most of them aren't here, but Did some he? of the staff at the time, no, I'm not gonna let you interrupt me. Go ahead, one second. Um, some of the staff at the time wouldn't be responsive with questions. Our staff is wonderful now in that regard. Um, but it required me to have to work with my colleagues. We had a time where I happened to be in the quote unquote majority or whatever you want to say it, worked with 
someone from a different viewpoint, and we compelled the Irvine Company to plant twice as many trees in Orchard Hills as they were required to. It was Marianne Guido, and she looked at me, she leaned over and she whispered, she said, why are you doing this? I said, because you like trees and I think it would make a better project. Better and she, she went, oh. That's called consensus building. When, when we had the takeover at Rancho Golf Club, I put something on the agenda and it probably wasn't out there for pu the public, but you know what I did before I put it on the agenda? I called Greg Smith, who is the chairman of the commission, and I said, Greg, I'm putting this on the agenda. It's probably gonna be a crazy night. I just want you to know. And he said, no, that's great. So I know that some people might see this as, you know, backroom dealings, or heaven forbid, a city council member talk to another city council member. I don't think we got elected to be silos. I don't think we got elected to not talk to each other. And the, the argument, there was a discussion earlier on, well, this would work if we were in districts. Well, I actually don't think it would work in districts because let's say I represented Woodbridge and I couldn't get a second to a motion and I couldn't get somebody to sign on to a memo. Well, you guess what? The community of Woodbridge would be in pretty dire straits but guess what? I represent Woodbridge. You know who else represents Woodbridge on this council? Councilmember Kahn, and Mayor Shea, and Councilmember Carroll, and Councilmember Fox. So, if one person can't get something done, there's four other people that the good residents of Woodbridge can turn to. This is about consensus building. This isn't about division. You know, if you want to say that this measure is a measure to force us to be nicer to each other, to force us to talk to each other, to force us to, to build consensus, I don't think that's a bad thing. I live in a community where, oh my gosh, you know what? I know my neighbors. We talk to each other. I had a discussion, I have a discussion with my neighbor, Mr. Risley, probably every other day where when he pulls into his driveway and I'm in mine and he says, I wanna talk to you about a city issue. And I talk to him. Talking to one another is a good thing. Working with your colleagues is a good thing. We already heard grandstanding is not a good, it's not, what was the word, considerate. Grandstanding is not considerate. Lobbing a bomb at your, at your, your colleagues for, for political theater is not considerate. But working together for the betterment of the city is. And when one person puts somebody, something on the agenda, knowing that it's not gonna go anywhere to rile up their neighbors, that is not healthy, that is not, that is not considerate. So I, I support the general concept, but no offense, Councilmember Khan, I, I don't support a sunsetting because then I do think it looks like it's directed at one person. So I wanna to turn to the city attorney. On our agenda, we always have, and I, when I was in the minority, I had to use this tool uh, we have announcements, committee reports, and council reports. So under council reports, I many times had to turn to a, putting, bring something forward under council reports because my colleagues would not work with me. So, um, and that is a vehicle that is very public, very open, that any council member can bring reports, updates, request, even at that point, that we don't vote on it, is that correct? Uh, but it allows them the opportunity to uh, share any of their concepts, ideas, or whatever they need to do with, within a certain limited time. Is that correct? Um, yes, it, what, it is correct that there is a space on the agenda for council members to speak about uh, their current activities and make reports on their, on their activities. I wanna be careful in responding because to the extent that that space on the agenda would be used to require that an item appear on a future agenda. No, I wasn't suggesting okay. that. I'm just suggesting that if there is an individual that wanted to put something on the agenda, they couldn't get support from another council member and I hopefully I would always be there to talk to that member and to try to defer to them and put it on. I would definitely go out of my way to do that if it wasn't contentious or political or just trying to be, you know, obnoxious, which has happened not recently to me, but in the past. Um, 
I would say that they could, under this council report, this is where they can bring it up an item and suggest that, you know, I really had wanted to put this on the agenda. I would hope that one of my council members and the public understand uh, that if a council member of the mayor would call me, I would like to have this on the agenda at a different point. I mean, there is this opportunity in a council reports to have this public dialogue. So it isn't something that people are shut down. They can't have any comments. It's really the tool I use for many times to have to get something out that was not being supported by my uh, council majority for many years. So anyway, that's the thought. Um, well, let's let's go back to discuss this item that's on a, a suggested motion in a second. I honest, honestly feel that I want to defer to Council Member Khan, but I do understand that um, anyone on a council can change this policy if they want to. If we just uh, implement it, and whenever there seems to be, uh, if we find that it's you know, turns out to be something we're not comfortable with or within the next year or two we want to do it. Anyone can agendize and ask for that to be um, taken off. So uh, is there any more discussion in regard to that? Okay. Point of order, Mayor. I should make a point of order. And this question asks at least for our clerk, because um, we also looked at this a little bit too, Molly. Isn't it true that I think, was it Santa Ana, there actually is an agendizing rule, but it's in the charter? of the mm -hmm. city, was it yeah. Santa Ana? Mm -hmm. So we do, mm -hmm. just, to, just to collaborate a little bit, just so my colleagues know some that, of the- What is that, Drew? That actually it would not be, the agendizing rules of the city of Santa Ana cannot be changed without initiative, is that correct, Jeff or Molly? So we do have the, I'm just confirming that we do have the ability to change our rules as a body, as how we agendize things by three it votes at any time. Yes. Um, but we did see that in some cities it's in the charter. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, Anthony Clark. Yeah, I have two, two additional points of discussion. It was raised, and it's something that I, as one person, support, um, that this rule would apply to the commissions. Is that an onerous thing, or do we would we have to come back with another? We, we would have to come back on that okay. because the commission rule is embedded in the commission bylaws, okay. so we need to bring amendments to the bylaws. All right, that's fine. And then the second is, I don't know if there are any exceptions that the council would be looking at, but the one that comes to mind is community partnership grants, which are generally nominated by one council member. Mm -hmm. I think that, I, I don't think there's anything laughable about that. I think there's a separate council policy that I read when I was appointed on that process that I think would run would this, parallel. Would but this, I would have to, Jeff, isn't that policy parallel? I don't think, I think it goes parallel to this. Yeah, that policy is parallel, but for clarification, you can simply direct the city manager to process and agendize community partnership grants. And that will take it outside of this policy because it'll be agendized by the city manager. So that's some things already can be done, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, so any thoughts in regard to sunsetting it or not sunsetting it? Do you want to make an alternative motion or? It's my thought. I don't feel strongly enough about it. Okay. Well, you said you didn't want to support it if it was there. I didn't. I, I, I'm willing to build consensus and <laughs> converse with my colleagues. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor, a second. Uh, with that, let's vote. And that's for the alternative motion to sunset it. Okay. Motion carries four to zero with member Fox absent. 